Does injecting the blood of the young into the old reverse the aging process? If this sounds like a crazy idea from Silicon Valley, that's because it is a crazy idea from the brilliant TV show Silicon Valley, or at least that's where I first heard about it. But I was amazed to find out when I looked it up that heterochronic parabiosis is actually a real thing. Are you really not familiar with parabiosis? I can't say that I am. Well, the science is actually pretty fascinating. Regular transfusions of the blood of a younger, physically fit donor can significantly retard the aging process. It's been in the news quite a lot recently, so I thought I'd make a video about it, and I assumed this would be an easy, quick, open and shut debunk of mad tech billionaires and their crazy pseudoscientific quest to live forever. But what I found out was actually a lot more interesting. This is episode two of If It Ducks Like a Quack, and with each topic I want to highlight some of the key elements that allow pseudoscience to thrive. In episode one we looked at the placebo effect, which I'm sure we'll return to in future, as well as selection bias. In this episode I want to take a look at how to design a trial to get the result that you want, if you're so inclined. But before that, young blood. Isn't this just a new manifestation of the ancient belief that drinking youthful blood would confer, well, youth? I think we drink virgin blood because it sounds cool. How have we now got to the situation where we've got companies in America excited to be giving blood products from young people to old codgers with more money than cents? Companies like Ambrosia, who are charging $8,000 a pop for a bag of plasma and even claimed to be running a clinical trial. This was me having my blood taken the other day. I've got to admit, it um, took a lot out of me. I only heard about heterochronic parabiosis about a year or two ago, but it's been the subject of study for quite a while. There's not a lot of current research, but a few decades ago it was quite in vogue. It fell out of fashion, but recently a few teams have been examining its effects in mice in very specific scenarios. The rough idea goes like this. Most death today is due to diseases associated with aging. Heart disease and Alzheimer's, for example, are very rare in young people, but extremely common as we get older. Something about aging increases your likelihood of developing these chronic diseases. You remember the constituents of blood. Red cells, the buffy coat, and plasma. Plasma is full of proteins, hormones, enzymes, signaling molecules, and so forth. If you remove clotting factors from plasma, you're left with something called serum. Whoa, whoa, whoa. wait a second. Serum? What? Your serum? Can't help me now, stud. The buffy coat? Well, that was pathetic. Blood of the young? Which one of you made me the way I am? There's definitely some kind of connection here. I just can't figure out what it could be. So what if we use plasma from the young to treat the old? A team studying neurological function of mice showed heterochronic parabiosis resulted in more neural stem cells, higher synaptic activity, less neural inflammation, and increased expression of genes involved with memory. They stated that blood factors in the young mouse caused these changes in the old mouse. And they went so far as to draw the parallel to humans, saying that we have very similar factors in our blood. This research took place in Stanford because, well, of course it did. Okay, I'm starting to understand how this all took off. Well, let's be an EDTA bottle half full kind of audience. And that all sounds fairly promising, right? I mean, obviously mice and humans aren't exactly the same, but it's not a huge leap to think that if infusing plasma from a young mouse into an old mouse caused all these fantastic changes, it might work in humans as well. Only, that's not what the researchers did. At all. I hate to be negative here, but this research is nothing like what Ambrosia was claiming that you might have seen in the press. Parabiosis actually involves stitching together two animals so that they share a circulatory system. The older animal doesn't just get blood from the younger animal, it has access to all of its organs as well. They essentially become conjoined twins. Or perhaps for a more accurate analogy, we could look to the legendary Walt Lillehei. One of my medical heroes, the father of modern cardiac surgery, Lillehei, developed cross-circulation before the cardiac bypass pump was invented. He plumbed together his patient, a child, to a human bypass machine, usually the child's parent, provided they were a compatible blood group. 
so that they could take over pumping around the child's body as well as their own while he fixed the child's heart. But that was nothing to do with rejuvenation. It was a desperate measure to try and save sick children. Outside that particular context, the idea of stitching two humans together is rather ghoulish. So already we can see that startups working in this field are using a very different idea. They're just giving infusions of donated plasma. In fact, researchers have discounted the possibility of studying transfusion-based therapies in mice because the amount you can safely remove in terms of volume is tiny, maybe 150 microliters. Jesse Carmazin, the CEO of Ambrosia, is a qualified medical doctor, although not currently practicing, and has been the face of this new industry with heavy promotion, boasting earlier this year that the company was operating in five cities. Remember when I said that doctors that promote pseudoscience particularly wind me up? Karmazin has made a lot of bold claims. He seemed to earn credibility from many in the press who were apparently stoked to hear that he was running a clinical trial, although that's really a very loose definition of the term. Let's take a look at the clinicaltrials.gov page because it's a good example of how not to design a trial. There is one arm, meaning that there is just one group of patients, those receiving the therapy. As you heard in episode one, unless you have a placebo arm or an arm comparing another established therapy, you can draw very little useful information from a single arm study. These were also paying customers. They weren't randomly selected patients. Now that's perhaps a bit of an unfair criticism. A lot of medical trials have patient populations that are not at all representative of the wider population, but it does give the impression that Ambrosia have retrofitted a trial onto what is actually a business model. Next, the endpoints. Just take a look at all these. This is a shopping expedition. Send off this many tests, and just by chance, you might get the following results. These ones go up, these ones stay the same, and these ones go down. Make sure you only tell people about the ones that went down, and hey presto, you've got a positive trial. And look at the time point, one month after the infusion. One month. What is that going to tell us? You don't need to be a haematologist to know that infusing one and a half litres into a circulating volume of five litres is going to transiently alter the makeup of your blood. And nobody's been able to demonstrate how long these changes last, even in mice. This is an example of choosing a favourable endpoint, something that is highly likely to give the result that you want, even if it's fairly meaningless. And measuring a blood test is a surrogate marker for actual health. There's no evidence that the majority of these tests that they've sent are actually reflective of overall health. Nobody takes a pill or starts a diet to improve their blood test. They do those things to be healthier. The bleeding edge of technology and medicine is a very exciting space, but we have to rein in our natural tendency to get carried away. My video on the Apple Watch touched on this. Another fantastic example is the famous Theranos case. But it seems that young blood is not going to be another chapter in the Medical Technology Chronicles, as the FDA made a bold statement on the 19th of February advising young plasma should not be transfused, as there is no proven clinical benefit, and importantly, there is real chance of harm. And as of last week, Ambrosia have announced that they are no longer providing the service. The idea has not thrombosed entirely, with the FDA making a proviso that it could still take place as part of a proper clinical trial. Companies like Alkahest are continuing research of young plasma-derived compounds, in their case looking at Alzheimer's. They recently published a double-blind crossover trial, i.e. already far more respectable than Ambrosia's, infusing young plasma into people with Alzheimer's. However, only nine patients received it, and Alzheimer's is a very hard disease to quantify. The effects were based on things like carers' feelings about how a patient is doing on a given day, or a person's response to a mini-mental test. I don't know about you, but my mini-mental test score varies quite considerably, according to just how hungry I am. To the author's credit, they haven't made any claims about its efficacy. This was an initial pilot study to assess safety, so it is officially safe blood. So right now, the science is complicated, and we have no reason to experiment on humans outside very specific disease scenarios. If you're offered a plasma transfusion, just say, fangs but no fangs. Remember oxygen bars? It's the same kind of faulty thinking. Just because oxygen is beneficial to someone with low oxygen levels, for example, with pneumonia, it doesn't mean that everyone will benefit from oxygen. So even if we do show that plasma is beneficial to some people with Alzheimer's, 
It's not a reason to start having in plasma infusions just because you've had too many birthdays. And finally, if you start a company with the express intention of selling blood to rejuvenate old people and you don't call your company Revamp, I'm sorry, you deserve to go out of business. A bit of an admission here, um, YouTube's new algorithm highlights fake news as it's uploaded, um, and this video has been flagged. It seems I misled you into thinking that this was a young person. Well, haters, I'll have you know I met a fellow YouTuber at VidCon who said he thought I looked 25 years old. And he was a great guy, it was lovely hearing about his channel where he chronicles his experiences as a blind man. If you thirst for more information like an ageing billionaire craves young plasma, you might want to consider upping the quality of your data infusions. I'm very grateful you watched my shonky video with no production budget, but you can access thousands of exceptionally high quality documentaries featuring people like Hans Rosling, David Attenborough and Jim El Khalili at Curiosity Stream entirely free of charge. There are loads of beautifully made and more importantly accurate medical documentaries including the very first title I went for when I joined which was Derek Muller from Veritasium's Vitamania. But actually in my off time I prefer to watch non-medical stuff and Curiosity Stream has got you covered there as well. I'm currently binging The Real War of Thrones, the historical events that inspired a certain television show returning to our sets next month. It's actually achieved the unthinkable and made me look forward to my overcrowded London commute. Worldwide unlimited access is $2.99 a month but you can get one month entirely free by visiting the link in the description below and using the code MEDLIFE. That's a month free with no obligation to continue so go and check out what they have on offer. From the outset of this channel I wanted to ensure that I was only contributing facts to the online world and not adding to the noise so it's really gratifying to see a service that does exactly that on a massive range of topics. Enough of this! Oh more than enough of this!